for his best absence. This is the reason why I have been delegated to replace him. Uh, in particular, as member, I think, of staff to the international policy uh, of Robert Hay. I have been uh, informed by Professor Francesco Guida, head of the Department of Political Science, concerning the research agenda, teaching and the dissemination activities included in the executive protocol signed in March. I'm certain the outcome will guarantee great results for both parties involved. In this sense, I would like to thank the people who spent their time and their energy to bring negotiation to a positive conclusion. The assistance of the international policy staff and the intermediation of the embassy personnel have been fundamental to reach the goal. Yes. Of course, there are also interests of the countries uh, out of the region, uh, interests of certain pressure groups in, in many EU and NATO countries. And again, and a, and a very important factor is that EU and NATO themselves are transforming. And on top of it, there is also the certain uh, economic, financial challenges that uh, Europe per se is living through. That's why now all this taking into account creates a very uh, big uh, box, tightly closed. Uh, we feel that there is something moving inside this box, but don't know that the box will open and what we will see emerging out of this box. Uh, that is why the leadership of, um, of the countries located in this region, uh, with the decades passing, and uh, we already have two, two decades of the, uh, independent development with all the pro pros and cons that it entails, uh, have come to conclusion that they, of course, uh, must rely more on their own resources, on their own potential, on their own vision of the world around them. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, the paradigm of their international relations is quite a uh, diverse uh, thing. And this is what uh, affects the uh, foreign uh, foreign policy. The liberal international system that was established at Bretton Woods and San Francisco in 1944, 45, 46, i.e. the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, all of these institutions that we love uh, so much, um, is the best international system ever devised. It is extremely resilient, it is extremely attractive, it is extremely flexible, and the rising powers China, Russia, Russia is a rising power, big question mark, Brazil, India, uh, South Africa, etc., have no alternative but to be co-opted, lock, stock and barrel, into the existing international liberal system. And that is what will happen. So the West should um, reinforce the existing international system, should not make compromises with the rising powers, because at the end of the day they will be forced to just be part of it. That's, I can bear the liberal international uh, version of power transition. Another version which is best put by uh, the former diplomat and professor Robert Hutchings, who is currently the dean of the LBJ School at the University of Austin in Texas, is that we are going to have to do a global grand bargain, that the rising powers will not accept And uh, I find this uh, uh, program really stimulating and uh, thought-provoking, uh, as we heard actually from the first uh, <clears throat> presentations this morning from Ambassador Sidikov and, uh, uh, and Professor uh, Howard. Actually, uh, I was uh, uh, thinking over what uh, they said and uh, how you know the, the issue, of course, of regional interests and uh, <clears throat> global interest at the same time is showing us that in this post uh, post Cold War time we are actually witnessing a, a, an increase of, of the number of uh, actors that are local actors of course as in this case but they of course have 
also an impact at the global level. So, well, I'm, I'm curious to hear what uh, our speakers have to say today <clears throat> about uh, Azerbaijan now is that uh, even in 1990, so Azerbaijan is the independent nation, and in 1990, I think every debate in Azerbaijan was how to master political resources uh, so that I can, Azerbaijan can develop its energy resources. But as Azerbaijan was quite successful despite odds, um, by the end of 1990s, I think 2000s, and even now, is about how this energy that has been uh, realized, energy projects, immense energy projects that has been realized, is now serving Azerbaijan diplomacy and Azerbaijan statehood. So in general, I think we could uh, make that a claim. When it comes to Azerbaijan, and when you talk about energy and diplomacy in general, I think there are three possibilities. One of them, and this is very usual way of looking at energy resources all over the world. Uh, energy is considered as a tool of diplomacy, as one of the tools available to a certain country. In the case of Azerbaijan, in the case of Azerbaijan it was more than that. So it's, it's more than being just a tool of uh, Azerbaijan's foreign policy. And overall, it's, it's a strategic outlook. The second version is when energy becomes the tool, the most important tool of foreign policy. I think in the case of Azerbaijan, we have even more than that. Uh, because what we have is that Azerbaijan foreign policy has been, in fact, um, developing within the context of uh, energy issues. And this is very different. I don't think there are many countries in the world which could be categorized um, uh, with, this, uh, with this situation. So in the case of Azerbaijan, when we talk about energy policy, we are not talking about just one of the policies like agricultural policy, economic policy, or social policy. Um, we are talking about the framework that determines not only foreign policy, but probably overall international identity of the country, of the nation. And this is not to say that we are led by energy. What I'm trying to say is that um, and energy has never been a purpose, but it has been a very complex, as I said, of our uh, international identity. But the main tool uh, of energy has been used to consolidate the budget and sovereignty. So many people today are asking questions about what Azerbaijan is up to, it is energy resources. If you want to predict Azerbaijan's behavior, if you want to understand what Azerbaijan, what kind of move Azerbaijan will make in a certain issue regarding pipelines, developing resources, I think one thing will help you a lot uh, to understand and predict Azerbaijan's state behavior, and that is that Azerbaijani oil and gas resources from the very start, they serve to consolidate uh, the countries. Uh, sovereignty and independence. Uh, there are certain groups, there are there could be certain people who would claim that, and this is a very generic cliche claim that sometimes energy resources are used to consolidate the power of those who are governing the country. And I think you could hear some people uh, that are making similar claims about Azerbaijan. And I would like to see questions in that regard because you will be surprised how many evidence, how much evidence you have showing that. Uh, at times, the political elite of Azerbaijan made decisions that was suicidal in terms of their survival per se, survival of the political group that was ruling Azerbaijan, but it was definitely uh, made to, again, consolidate Azerbaijan's sovereignty. In 1994, as we were talking with Ambassador Sadukov, actually, in the meantime, and he uh, definitely, as, as he was talking about the situation, there were several times that Azerbaijani political leadership made decisions regarding the development and trans transport of the resources of Azerbaijan in the European direction, and most of those decisions have been very risky ones for that time, but because of oil and gas. Right? So oil and gas was both a liability and an asset. Uh, so it's not that Nagorno Karabakh was happening in the vacuum, but many people were claiming that these things are happening because some countries in the neighborhood were using uh, it as a pretext so that they could have more say on uh, the decisions that Azerbaijan has to make on oil and gas. Uh, but what happened, I think Azerbaijan played very cleverly. Uh, and one of the biggest dilemmas that we had, we couldn't pursue both policies at the same time. We couldn't both save Nagorno-Karabakh from invasion and develop our energy resources. We had to sacrifice one of them. And it happened so that Azerbaijan eventually had to give up on, temporarily speaking, on one of the main patterns in Nagorno-Karabakh, but Azerbaijan was successful to develop its oil and gas resources. And this is a very important thing in our um, recent history. 
that, in a sense, the development of oil and gas resources happened uh, because of a certain sacrifice in terms of the territorial interests of the country. Uh, because we couldn't simply pursue both of them at the same time. But as Azerbaijan is now developing its energy resources and uh, gaining some political and financial resources, Azerbaijan is now ready and become, is becoming more vocal in terms of uh, uh, regaining its lost sovereignty over its legal uh, territories we refer to as Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, again, so in the regional context, what does energy mean, uh, Azerbaijan energy resources mean in the region, in the, in the South Caucasus, and in, in, in global? Region? I think regarding our region, for Georgia and Turkey, it has been a blessing. Uh, I think it increased because, as you know, the main pipelines carrying Azerbaijan resources go through Georgia and Turkey. So those energy resources we are talking about, they not only consolidated our own independence and sovereignty, but also helped Georgia and Turkey in that regard. It increased their strategic value because without them, and, and, and as you know, the direction of Azerbaijan resources are going in the western direction, without them it wouldn't have happened. And because they have uh, uh, become the root of Azerbaijan oil, they acquired more strategic importance in the eyes of the West. For Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, it has been a support. In what sense? Because Azerbaijan became the main actor in the South Caucasus, uh, which broke the monopoly in the former Soviet Union over the shipment of oil and gas. We sometimes talk about who is bringing more security to the post-Soviet space. And if you think about the post-Soviet state space, what you had, uh, former Soviet Union, as you know, you had the South, Southern Caucasus countries, you had Central Asian countries, you had the Baltic states.